things are going to go that shit crazy. I need to take my glasses off because holy Jesus, my son, my son was threatened. I have thoughts. I have feelings. I cried. Saw it coming. Also, Hey besties, it's Jaw, and welcome back to episode 3 of Reading the Royal Universe, where this week I'm going to be reading The Heroes of Olympus series by Rick Ryden, and I'm super excited to finally be getting to this series because one, it's the sequel to Percy Jackson, but also two, so many of you have been anticipating for me to read this series because you're excited or you just want to see me suffer, which I'm happy to oblige with because I love pain, and I've suffered through many series once before, so of course I'm gonna do it again, you know? It's gonna be fun, it's gonna be fun! I say this in a very high-pitched voice. I hope you're staying very well and hydrated. If you've yet to take a drink of water, please do so. And if you've yet to check out my bookstagram nor my Twitter, I would highly recommend you go do that as well because I post some extra bookish content that you're not gonna see here. And before we get into today's video, I do have a very quick message from today's sponsor, and so I'm gonna throw it on over to Sponsor Joel in order to tell you all about that. Hello besties, I'd like to thank Book of the Month for sponsoring today's video. Book of the Month is a super popular book service for readers located within the US, with their main objective to promote new and emerging authors and help readers discover books that they'll love. Each month, Book of the Month curates a selection of new and early release titles for you to choose from, so that you can spend a little less time researching and a little more time reading intriguing tales. Plus, Book of the month is risk-free, so you can skip any month, any time, and you won't be charged. I was fortunate enough to receive all five of their August picks, and included were The Heart Principle, following Anna's son after she realises, after a failed one-night stand, or two, that she might have found something rare with Quan Deep. True love. Damnation Spring, which follows a family struggling to make ends meet in a logging town divided over the fate of its forest. The Inheritance of Okita Divina, which depicts the Montoyas as they receive a truly magical inheritance after their matriarch's funeral, but with great riches come great enemies. Not a Happy Family, a twisted domestic suspense of a wealthy family unraveling after their parents are murdered. And finally, Once They Were Wolves, following a woman's journey to Scotland determined to save the wilderness, but tragedy bites just as a new life starts to settle. I think the first one that I'm going to be picking up though is the Inheritance Volkita Divina because I am in love with like magical inheritance stories. Plus, I've yet to read as a writer Cordova novel, and I think this would be a very good first one. If that sounds great to you and you have a US-based shipping address, then you can use the link in my description and use code FATES in order to get your first book of the month box for $9.99. And again, a massive thank you to Book of the Month for sponsoring today's video. And now we can get back to the amazing Heroes of Olympus. And so yeah, the Heroes of Olympus series is one that I have been dying to get into because apparently Nico D'Angelo really comes through in this series and so I'm really excited for that, and like I just mentioned, a bunch of you want to see me suffer, so I'm happy to oblige in that too. But I'm just gonna dive right in and look at the beautiful, beautiful covers of this series, because they're just amazing. I think they're some of the most well-designed books in the Ryodenverse, and I love them. And so we have The Lost Hero, The Son of Neptune, The Mark of Athena, The House of Hades, and finally, The Blood of Olympus. And I'm really excited to be getting into these, because if you've yet to check out the very first two episodes, episodes of Reading the Rowan Verse, where I read Percy Jackson and the Olympians, and also the Kane Chronicles, I would highly recommend you go check both of those videos out, because they have just opened my mind to the Rick Riordan's writing, and just how amazing and whimsical it can be, and I think it's really going to come through in the Heroes of Olympus series, which is actually much longer than the other books previously, as his books usually range between like 300 to 400 pages, whilst these are actually in the 500 to 600 range. So I'm really excited to see like the extension of Ryodin's writing throughout this series and how amazing it can be. Going back to these gorgeous covers, they were again designed by John Rocco with the jacket design by Joan Hill, and I just think that John Rocco just does covers so beautifully. Like, this illustration is just beautiful, and it's really nice to see the kind of different ways his illustration comes through in the a multitude of covers, like we see with the Kane Chronicles and Percy Jackson and the Olympians. His illustrations just capture the essence of the book so well. But yeah, I'm just really excited to finally be getting into these because I am so excited to see what happens next in the Greek division of the Ryodin base and see how everything carries on after Percy Jackson and the Olympians. But also all of the comments that I've been receiving on the Percy Jackson video and my mid-year book freakout tag, I think a lot of people are really excited for me to read this series 
and suffer along with them and also celebrate along with them and just see how our son Nico D'Angelo is actually doing because I'm so excited to see him. And a lot of people did say House of Hades might be the one that like gets to me the most. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I for one am really excited about it. I cannot wait to like finally delve into this series. And honestly, I just really want to dive right in. I'm not going to start the book tonight because I do have a few extra things to do and I do have a vlog to edit, but I will be diving into this tomorrow morning and I think I'll probably try and consume as much as I can. I don't have much to do tomorrow, so I might just stay in bed and read. I could do that. I could do that. Who knows? It is a vibe. It is mood. But as well, I am bisexual and I do have ADHD, so I don't know whether I'm going to be able to stay in one place the entire time. Maybe if I have music on. I mean, you can just let me know in the comments about your reading positions because like, I for one do a lot of different ones. But yeah, I'm going to get to reading The Lost Hero tomorrow morning and I will catch up with you once I've finished. Give my whole thoughts on the spiel. You know how this works. I'm going to just read my way through the Heroes of Olympus and you'll get to see every single major reaction that I have. And I'm really excited about that. I'll catch you in a bit, besties. Okay, let's get the dust jacket back on so that we can discuss this book. Hello besties, I finished The Lost Hero and I have a lot of things to say. Where do I start? I don't want to like go on a ramble, but I feel like it's going to go into a ramble. I need to talk about plot structure and the mirroring of plot and the repetition of history. Let's cover that. So, The Lost Hero repeats and mirrors a lot of The Lightning Thief, which is a really good thing. And I think Rick Riordan is masterful in doing this because we're being introduced to the second great prophecy and The Lightning Thief introduced the first great prophecy. So of course, repeating a similar plot structure would be great in introducing these great prophecies. But also we get to see the dynamic of Jason, Piper and Leo in this novel, which is very reminiscent of the dynamic of Percy Annabelle and Grover, which is again a good thing because it already grounds us within the dynamic and see how it works. So Rick Ryden doesn't have to spend a lot of time rebuilding a brand new dynamic, but he has an already established one that he can just tweak slightly. And it works because these characters do feel individual in themselves, whilst also keeping similar aspects to Percy, Annabeth and Grover from the previous series. And it's great because of the Great Prophecy, because these heroes are supposed to be heroes and so already establishing them as growing to be heroes is great because now we don't have to worry about kind of everything else because of the fact that also they go through a similar sort of quest where they have to retrieve something or someone whilst also going through a bunch of different 
difficulties, we get a lot of similar plot threads from The Lightning Thief in The Lost Hero, which shows kind of a similar build up to A Great Prophecy, but what Rick Ryden does differently in The Lost Hero is up the stakes. He ups them to a point where we know things are going to go batshit crazy, and we know things are going to go extremely wrong. It's where we can see a growth both in his writing but also a growth in the limits that he'll take his characters to because we have Leo who's basically dealing with childhood trauma of his mother's death whilst also meeting the people that caused his mother's death which is probably affecting him in some way and it makes me want to hug that child. I just want to protect him with my life. And then we also get Jason who is an amnesiac, doesn't remember anything but we also get to see the way that Jason tackles certain situations and he kind of remembers things now and again, like fragments of his memory come back. So it shows that he's still able to be the hero that he needs to be. Piper, on the other hand, is probably the character that experiences the most growth within this novel. She didn't really have much self-confidence or self-worth in the beginning, especially when it came to Drew and the Aphrodite campus and the way that they treated her. But throughout the novel, she gained that self-confidence, that power within herself and is able to use it and able to reclaim power for herself. And it's great because we really get to see an evolution of her character and evolution of her character arc, which will continue in future subsequent novels. But what I'm trying to say about this entire thing is that Rick Ryden basically re-establishes a great prophecy plot, whilst also remixing it and refreshing it to give us something new, which is what he did in The Lost Hero. So he's basically made the work easier for himself, whilst also giving us a much more fleshed out and drawn out story. I can already see why a lot more people prefer the Heroes of Olympus series. We also got a few interactions with this novel with Hera, Aphrodite and Hephaestus, however, Ever. Zeus has basically locked the gods away, so we didn't really get that much, but the interactions that we did get were very interesting, and I think will prove well for future novels. Plus, I do kind of have a theory about Piper, the way that she has a strong voice. I feel like she might charm a snake at some point, I don't know, but it feels, I, I, don't, I don't know why I feel this, but I feel like she might charm a snake at some point because of certain passage in this novel. Yeah, we also have this bigger mystery going on, actually, I just remembered, with Camp Half-Blood and Camp Jupiter, which hasn't really actually been said in this novel, but I know it's Camp Jupiter, so it's really interesting, and the way that we get to see kind of, oh my gosh, I forgot to talk about this, the way that we get to learn about like the Roman aspects of gods and the way that Rick Ryden explains that is just so good, because I was pretty worried, because I was like, are we gonna have like Zeus and Jupiter and then just like have them fight each other, whatever? But no, the way that like the Greek gods can just shift in into their Roman aspects. It's very interesting, like we see Hera shift into Juno. It's good, it's amazing, and I love it. I think like it's a really easy way to just solve a complicated issue, but also the way that like Percy's just gone, he's just disappeared. It really gives us a sense of urgency because Percy is the hero that we relied on a lot in the Percy Jackson, the Olympian series, because he is the titular main character. However, him being like gone, but this novel means that we need to rely on these new characters in order to solve the problem for us. Of course, if Percy was still there, he probably would have gone on the quest as well, or found some way to help. And we really needed this book for the characters to actually grow without Percy being there. I also need to talk about Leo, because Leo and Nico D'Angelo are like my two favourite characters now. Maybe it's because Leo can wield fire, maybe it's because Leo can wield fire, but that boy just, he speaks to me. Can I adopt like some campers? Can I adopt some of these children? It's what I want to do now. Maybe I, I can, oh my god, I can run like a happy home for like poor orphan children. Oh. But yeah, I really, really enjoyed this, and I think it's a very strong beginning to the series, which now leads me on to The Son of Neptune, and I already know who this is referring to, which I'm really excited about, but also reading the synopsis, it seems like we might not get to see Jason Piper or Leo in this as, like, point of view voices, which is interesting because it feels like we're getting stories from, like, both sides of, like, the demigod encampments before they actually meet potentially in the third book or in the end of the second book, but it's gonna be really interesting to be reintroduced to Percy Jackson as a character, given the circumstances. I already have an idea of who like the seven are gonna be, Percy and the two others, Jason Piper and Leo, and then Nico D'Angelo. Yeah, I mean I'm only gonna find out by reading anyway. Okay, I can, I can, I can hold these two books in my head. I no. Anyway, I'm gonna get to reading The Son of Neptune, and I will catch up with you once I've finished, and do my whole spiel as I usually do, like the chaotic bisexual I am. See you soon.
time to get again. Hello besties, I finished The Son of Neptune and my brain, my brain is currently being fried. I need to take my glasses off because holy Jesus. Camp Jupiter is really interesting and I love the way that Ryoden sets up Camp Jupiter as a kind of a much more vicious and rougher Camp Half-Blood. Like they're very ruthless in the way that they kill and very ruthless in the way that they dictate things but it's very representative of the Roman Empire. Plus we got a little bit of more of an exploration into the Camp Jupiter side of things and how like people are selected, how people are sorted, and it's great. Like it's very much a more equal based system where like you're never really gonna be on your own, you'll always have someone there beside you and it's amazing. We get reintroduced back to Percy and I have missed him. I've missed his voice, the way that he is able to analyze a situation and he's great, he's amazing. I'm so glad that he's back now, but also we get introduced to Hazel and Frank, two very interesting characters who are just very well developed, very very well rounded, also have their own personal conflicts within this novel, but also overcome them and get through them. I really like it. I think Hazel as a character is very interesting, being the sister to Nico to Angelo, who we'll get into in a second, and Frank being this amalgamation of different cultures coming together and him trying to figure out his identity, but also figure out how he's supposed to grapple his family's legacy and continue it on. And it's amazing. I think this book just shone really well and it really sets up now for the future subsequent novels, The Mark of Athena, House of Hades, Blood of Olympus, the next two novels of which everyone has said will cause me pain and I'm not looking forward to that besties, I'm not looking forward to that at all. I think like one thing this novel did really well was kind of give us again that similar plot structure to what we had in The Lost Hero and The Lightning Thief to introduce these characters and kind of show both sides of the setting up towards the second great prophecy and the, and like the next next war that we're gonna have with Gaia. Nico D'Angelo comes back in this and literally the moment I s saw his words, I screamed. I, this boy is amazing. My son, iconic, but Gaia, Gaia, you bitch. I'm going to find you. Well, I'm gonna see now in The Mark of Athena what exactly is going to happen. Rick Riordan does really well in trying to tackle de the development of a lot of different characters and introducing characters and giving them distinct personalities. I love it. I think Camp Jupiter in and of itself, we didn't really spend that long there. Like we did get a little bit like, like the kind of like Camp Half-Blood beginnings that we got from The Lightning Thief. I am now gonna move on to The Mark of Athena. I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't, I, uh, I know Annabeth is gonna go through a lot in this novel. I'm not looking forward to seeing the sacrifices or the pain she's about to go through. I'm not looking forward to seeing how the dynamic between everyone's gonna have changed. I'm afraid, I'm so afraid. It has to happen and this gorgeous red, I think the Heroes of Olympus has just literally taken Percy Jackson the Olympians and just stepped it up to like a hundred and has escalated, escalated. Still have the snake charming prediction for Piper, but we'll see what happens. Oh my God, Piper, Pied Piper. But yeah, I'm gonna get to reading The Mark of Athena, do my whole spiel, and I might be crying. Who knows? See you in a bit.
You know the drill. Okay, I'm just gonna get right into it. I'm in pain right now. I am in so much pain because of this book. I was doing fine for like the first part. Then my boy, my son, my son was threatened. He went through a whole thing and I was feeling bad. And then the ending happened. Rick Riordan, the ending. I'm, I'm happy because it's great writing craft, but also how dare you? How dare you leave me on this type of cliffhanger and expect me to like not want to pick up the next book right away. Oh wait, I have the next book. But how could people survive a year without knowing what happens next? Like I... How? 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 I was, I was on the verge of tears, but also let us recap. So in this novel, we get the seven heroes interacting for the first time prominently. It's a great lineup. And I think that we definitely have something that's pretty cool in this, in which there's various dynamics between the demigods. We definitely get to see like Percy and Jason come to terms with the fact that they're both quite leaders in their own respective camps and trying to figure out how to be leaders together. But also it's the funny thing that they're both basically pushed to the back of this novel. And it's really the other characters that rise to prominence. And I think Rick Riordan does this intentionally because he needs to show that not everyone is basically relying on Percy or Jason for instructions. They are able to make their own choices and make their own decisions. And this is why the series is a much more character driven novel as opposed to a plot driven novel. These character arcs in this book were amazing. We definitely got to see character dynamics evolve and change throughout this. It's specifically with the Hazel Frank Leo dynamic and how everything it works within that and it, I think it's definitely going to become much more prominent in the House of Hades and also the Blood of Olympus and seeing how that dynamic evolved. This novel was just outstanding writing. I know a lot of people warned me that the ending was tragic. It's definitely up there in one of my favourites. I think my favourite still is probably The Last Olympian. This definitely comes at like a close second and I'm excited but I do think House of Hades might take the cake. Some people even say like this is even better and I'm afraid I'm wearing like black right now because I'm in mourning, but like they might not be dead. I mean, they basically alluded to the fact they might not be dead. Plus this cover alludes to the fact they might not be dead. I'm holding out hope that everything's going to be okay and that like whilst I do kind of have theories about what's going to go down, specifically with like the blood of Olympus, we need an epic final battle. You know, these heroes need to prove themselves. Leo, oh my gosh, Leo Valdez. Leo Valdez comes in close second as like my favorite character of the series. Leo and Nico, they're just my kids. I love them. Leo definitely has a lot of traits that I resonate with and he's definitely the one to try and make humor out of a situation but can't really read social cues that well and it's what leads him into a lot of tricky situations and I just think that he just wants to make friends and I think specifically with what happens to him throughout the novel with Gaia telling him that he's the seventh wheel, um, I mean that kind of makes sense because everyone else is kind of in a couple and then it's Leo. It, it's it's pretty difficult for him to be fair because he's just feeling left out because he doesn't really feel like he has someone close that he can talk to apart from his machines. And it's definitely a dynamic that is uh, talked about a lot. Oh my gosh, I could see, I now want to write essays about these characters in the ways that they grow as people, but also highlight different issues within society and also interpersonal developments. Like Rick Ryder is so clever in the way that he develops these characters. It's just perfect. Going back to Leo, he relies on machines to like talk to and communicate with and he doesn't really have that kind of close friendship bond that he wants but he's starting to get that and starting to realize that he is part of this group. And I definitely think throughout like the next two books he'll also begin to realize that there is just a lot more to him than he lets on and so I'm excited to see how he's going to contribute to the dynamic and why Gaia is so intrigued to get rid of him because we have a bigger cast of characters now within this universe. We've expanded the Greek universe into Greek and Roman and we're just suddenly, we suddenly just have a lot more to play with and a lot more to explore and I think Rick Ryden has just done it so spectacularly well that I'm really excited to see what's going to happen in the House of Hades and like it's purple underneath, which I'm really loving. So I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to it. So I'm gonna get to read in the House of Hades. Probably gonna suffer, potentially gonna cry. I just remembered what happened to Nico as well. Um, You'll see everything that I react to and we'll catch up and we'll discuss how much I've suffered. See you in a bit, besties.
I've got my Mount Olympus jacket back on, this t-shirt that says thinking of you. It's got like a skull on the back. I would show you, actually, can I show you? It's got like a skull on the back. It's pretty cool. I have thoughts. I have feelings. I cried. The House of Fucking Hades is... That would be a whole different book. The House of Hades is a phenomenal novel because it does so many things super well. It provides our main cast of characters with a situation that in, like forces them basically to evolve as people. Our main two, Percy and Annabeth, have been separated from the group. It really allows a lot of the characters to go through their own personal journeys. We see Nico coming to terms with some very, very powerful revelations about himself and starting to open that journey for him, which was emotional. We got to see Frank and Hazel start to realise things about themselves and realise their own power. And we see this through Frank mostly in terms of his father, Ares slash Mars, trying to get him to become more warlike and more commanding. And we definitely get to see Frank assume that position and become more of a leader, which is very, very exciting to see. We also see Hazel come to terms with her own power, both as a daughter of Pluto, but also as a sorceress. And so it's very exciting to see that kind of development happen as well and just see these characters grow. This was definitely a novel for Nico, Hazel and Frank, but that doesn't mean we didn't get other cute bits as well. We see Leo experiencing something in this novel as well that allows him to really come to terms with like his emotions and how he feels, but also finally meet someone who gets him. He makes a promise and I really, really hope this promise comes through because they would just be so good together and like it would be great and like I do kind of ship it even though I don't really like to ship underage characters together, but like, this is something that I'm like, I feel like this is going to happen. And so this needs to happen because Leo Valdez, Leo Valdez and Nico D'Angelo are like my two favorite characters of this series. It used to be like, I really liked Percy Annabeth. We haven't seen Grover. Where is Grover? I want more Grover content, like a little bit more Grover content, but that might come in like maybe the Trials of Apollo. I have no idea. We get to see Percy and Annabeth as well go through their own personal journey through where they end up after the end of the Mark of Athena. And it's definitely tough because Nico had to spend like time there on his own. And I just don't get how he survived because Percy and Annabeth, oh, it, it was just literally like so hard to watch them go through everything. And, but I guess it really solidified their bond together and like their relationship. They basically realized that like they love each other like more than anything and they want to like, the end game. Speaking of end game, I think this next novel is going to be like the end game. Well, to be fair, that could be the Charles Popolo series, like being the end game. But this is kind of like a sub end game where like, I think all the camps are going to come together and they're going to fight against Gaia. House of Hades was just chef's kiss. It was superb writing, superb plot, superb character development. We got to really see some really good moments. We got to see some really great characters and see that not everything is strictly good and evil when it comes to there's evil giants, but there are also good giants. We can have evil titans, but good titans. And um, we can see evil demigods and also good demigods. It's very much not judging something by what it is, but what it presents to you as. Not everything is strict. And I think Rick Ryden does this really well in challenging the perceptions that we have on people. It's great because it teaches kids that like they shouldn't judge something based on its cover or who they are, but rather get to know them and take away all like prejudices and expectations. And it's a great message to teach to kids. And I'm very, very happy that like this series is doing that. And especially with Nico's uh, character arc throughout this and what he experiences with Jason when he goes to see Cupid. Like it's amazing. It's so good. And like Nico is definitely fighting a lot of internalized emotions right now based on like how he's feeling about himself and I definitely feel like we're gonna see a lot of it come up in the blood of Olympus and potentially in future like novels as well yeah it's 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 a tough time and I think like he is definitely going through a lot of stuff that I previously had gone through as a kid and so I wish the best for him because you know he is a great child and he just does if nothing but like warmth and hugs we'll now be moving on to the blood of Olympus which is the final novel in in the series. The cover is stunning. The cover is so beautiful and I am just really excited to see what's going to happen in this. I'm so afraid but also this is the shortest of the series like The Last Olympians and I think it's because Rick Ryden does really well to wrap things up pretty nicely but also leave enough that there is quite a few plot threads that can come up in future short stories or sequel 
series. And so I guess we're gonna have a fun time with this. This is literally like 500 pages, so I think I'm gonna finish it tonight or tomorrow morning. I'm really excited. I think we're just gonna see a lot of combination of character growth. I'm gonna finally get some questions that have been burning since the start of this series answered. My theory about the snake hasn't come true yet. Maybe it won't come true, I have no idea. But there was, there were snakes mentioned, like snakes did come in at some point, but Piper charming a snake hasn't actually happened. I'm gonna get to reading The Blood of Olympus in a little bit, but I will catch up with you once I've finished, give my whole thoughts and feelings, and yeah, you know the whole spiel. See you in a bit, besties. So, for the final time in this video, let us put the dust jacket back on. Hello, so I finished The Blood of Olympus, and by doing so, I also finished the Heroes of Olympus series by Rick Riordan. Holy Jesus, this book, this book, I I went in with a, like a bit of high expectations because obviously The Last Olympian wrapped up the series so well and was able to give us a really satisfying ending. This book, Stella. Amazing. There was enough action, there was enough character development, everyone really got to shine in this novel in their own respective ways, and it was just really nice to finally get a kind of ending to some of these character journeys, and it was just really nice and really great to see a lot of these characters culminate in their character arcs. We also got a little bit of a lead up to the Trials of Apollo series, which was very nice to see, and I saw it coming. Also, my prediction about Piper came true. She charmed a snake technically a snake, but she charmed a snake because of that line that I saw in like the very first book. Like my mind, 
my mind. Wow, galaxy brain thinking right there, but I'm so proud of myself for that. I feel like one of those like TV show theorists who came up with like a crackpot theory and then it actually came true and yeah, I'm just very happy, I'm like excited about that. This novel tackles a lot in a very short amount of pages, but I think the key theme of this entire series has been family and belonging because we see a multitude of characters realize that like they don't really know where they belong. We see it with Nico where he's torn between two camps but also doesn't really feel like anyone cares about him. We see this with Jason who doesn't really feel like Camp Jupiter is for him anymore and he much prefers Camp Half-Blood or some of the aspects of it. And we see Hazel coming to terms with the fact that she has a new brother. It's amazing. It's just so good to see all these people come together and realize that they have a family. I mean, Leo. Leo Valdez realizing that he actually isn't the seventh wheel. He's the seventh member of a family and it's just so amazing and sweet and I think that this novel just did super well in that. Plus we got to see right at the end Nico, um, Nico and Leo are just the two most amazing characters that this series has produced. Nico to Angelo just grows so much in this novel and like realizes a lot of things. His and Raina's like friendship is one of my favorite friendships of the series because of the way they're just so open and honest with one another. It was when she got to see all of his pain and all of his hurt and all of his suffering and loved him even more for it and like Nico just didn't know how to react to that and it was just so beautiful and amazing because it definitely happens a lot with someone who's been through a lot of pain. When someone shows them comfort and support it's jarring because they're not used to that and it's just amazing and I definitely see a bit of a connection between him and Will so I'm excited to see whether they'll come up in the Trials of Apollo series. Leo Valdez on the other hand I he is just amazing. He is such a good kid and like we got to see throughout this novel him prove himself time and time again as not only a master inventor but also a really great friend as well and it, it was definitely emotional reading like his character journey throughout this but we can just see what happens I guess. Overall this story is just amazing. This is one of like belonging, dismissing prejudices and coming together to face a great enemy to which was actually an amazing build up and gave us a really satisfying conclusion as well and we just got to see a lot of great things unfold and it was, am oh, this book was just so good. The entire series was amazing and I definitely prefer this over Percy Jackson and the Olympians because I think I would probably go to reread this more than I would PGAO. It's stellar. This book is, this book series is just stellar and I'm so, so excited that I finally got to read it. And so wraps our Heroes of Olympus reading vlog. This book series is just so amazing. If you have yet to read it, I would highly recommend picking it up once you finish Percy Jackson and the Olympians. This series just steps everything up to another level and really sets up the Trials of Apollo nicely because there's definitely a few plot threads that I think will come up in that series and it's definitely interesting to see other characters then take the spotlight and also a god now with Apollo but I'm really really excited for it. If you love Heroes of Olympus and have any thoughts of your own be sure to leave them down in the comment section down below because I would love to just discuss the series with you in the comments but also please be aware to tag spoilers if you d do decide to discuss spoilers in the comment section. That wraps episode three of Reading the Royal Inverse. I hope you had a lot of fun today. Next month, we'll be delving into Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard, which is something that I'm really excited for because I do love Norse mythology and I really want to see like Thor, Odin, and like Loki. And then in October then, we'll be delving into the Trials of Apollo. So I hope you stick around for that. And I'm just really excited to see where the rest of this series goes. And so yeah. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you're new here, be sure to click that subscribe button so that you're notified whenever I upload next. I'll leave all of my social medias linked in the description down below so you can follow me on there. Plus, I do have a link to my coffee page as well, which you can leave a well-appreciated tip, which can be used to improve this channel further. I, this, I'm gonna need like a week to like process this series and also fill out the adoption papers for my two new sons, Nico and Leo. So, until the next time, from this son of Apollo, Bye, besties.